your paws off. No. Okay, I was just explaining that we have eight days in which to cover the book of Isaiah. My aim is not to cover the entire book. My aim is to do parts of the book well, or to do as much of as we can well, so that you not only get the sense of Isaiah, but that you learn how to uh, outline and structure a book, or how to find the structure of a book, because that's really what exposition is all about, looking at uh, the structure of a unit and discovering the smaller structures within that unit and asking yourself how do these smaller structures relate to the larger structure and so you will find structures within structures within structures you will find outline within within outline without within outline okay and that uh, that is the key to expounding a book so one of the first things that we're going to do is we're going to look for the big structure that gives sense to the smaller structure, that gives sense to the smaller units, okay? Uh, so we're going to work from the outside and, and work our way down to the smallest unit. <coughs> and of course, exposition, uh, we don't go as in-depth into a verse or into an outline as we would if we were doing a course on exegesis. In exegesis, we would do word studies. Uh, we would do syntactical studies, study the syntax, and uh, go into the original languages. With exposition, we could do that, and if you were a faithful exegete, uh, exegesis comes before exposition. You know, uh, exegesis means you you study the smaller units to give the larger units sense. Exposition, you are looking at the larger units. Uh, and discovering relationships within those larger and smaller units. So it all works hand in hand, but we just won't have time to uh, get at uh, the word studies and the smaller units. Let me go over the course outline for you. First of all, uh, you are to read through the book of Isaiah by the end of the course, Friday noon. That's going to be worth 10% of your course. Uh, you are to read Baxter's commentary on Isaiah in conjunction with your Bible reading. That's worth 15%. Now, I didn't look at Baxter myself yet, but I have discovered that it's really not a whole lot of reading. Uh, Bob's got it done already. And uh, then class attendance and participation. I think that's worth something. So uh, we'll give you 10% for that. If you miss a class, well, uh, other, other than for reasons of sickness, uh, you will lose some marks. If you sit there like a bump on a log and don't participate, you're going to lose marks as well, okay? But we don't want you to shovel it either, just for the marks. Okay? We want you to participate meaningfully. Um, Phil, of course, uh, we trust that you'll participate in your mind, um, in your heart with us. Choose. Uh, fourthly, you choose two messianic prophecies in Isaiah. Now, I'm sort of... Uh, going out on a limb here I have never done this um, and I don't know how this is going to work out but we want you to do your best here to to choose two messianic passages in Isaiah use those two passages as a basis for a paper that you're going to write for a hypothetical Jewish friend I and no pardon me I have no Jewish friend. do you know what the word hypothetical means pretend okay show him why from an exegetical logical and prophetic point of view these passages point to none other than Jesus Christ research various interpretations of those passages and deal with any possible objections that a Jew might have to your assertions from those passages is that understood is that clear to everyone Okay. Um, <coughs> for instance, you go to Isaiah chapter, is it 53, the suffering servant? Uh, if it's not Jesus Christ, who is it? Who can it possibly be? What are the, uh, some of the other classical interpretations? <laughs> go find the Jew and see if anybody really asks him to write you an article. <laughs> or go on the internet and get James or someone else to find articles for you about that. Or library. 
Is there a li is there a library in Sault Ste. Marie? You can share. Sure, you can share. Yeah. Or if nothing else, just go by the scriptures and do your best to prove that these passages are speaking about Jesus Christ. But you have to speak from a an Old Testament point of view. Don't read into the Old Testament from the New Testament unless it's just supportive or corroborative. Uh, for instance, if if fulfillment in the New Testament is so specific that you can use that as support that this is that you know this is speaking about that that's okay but let's try to look at Isaiah from Isaiah's point of view okay uh, so minimum eight typewritten pages one and a half uh, lines not two secondly another paper and this is a shorter paper three pages or less write a paper to convince me Uh, then write the final exam. It'll be a take-home exam, 25%. Um, commentaries on Isaiah of various sorts will be available here. Uh, some I haven't looked at, so I don't know whether they're going to be liberal, conservative, middle of the road. I uh, have no idea. But uh, my my theory is always that even even a stop clock is right twice every 24 hours. So even liberal commentaries sometimes have good things to say. We can learn even from non-believers. Okay? So uh, don't, don't judge a book because it's liberal or something like that. I don't think that these are liberal. This is on Dr. Hawk's library. Two of these. By the way, some of these books are borrowed from a friend of mine in Sault Ste. Marie. So these books are not to leave this room okay please if you want to study from these commentaries stay up here and study um, if any of these books go missing that are borrowed I'm going to ask you to share the cost of replacing them all right if they go missing okay <coughs> any other questions on the requirements for the course Book of Isaiah, hopefully. Yeah. All right. Let's get to the introduction. We need to begin this study with a few comments. First of all, you know that the course was kind of dropped on me, and it came as a kind of a total surprise. I volunteered to do it, okay? It wasn't forced on me. Uh, I look forward to doing it because it's been a long time since I have done an in-depth study of the Book of Isaiah. And uh, I always look for an excuse to uh, get into it, you know, something that I haven't done for a while. So here the opportunity came along and I grabbed it. But because of that, I don't have the background knowledge that one really ought to have. So I'm doing what... Never apologize for what you're going to say. I'm apologizing for... Um, historical, uh, like I won't be able to fill in all the historical details that are really necessary to do a job really well. Uh, many writers refer to Isaiah as the gospel of Isaiah. In many common, you read commentators, uh, most of them will refer to Isaiah as you know, uh, the gospel of the Old Testament, simply because uh, it is a book that is filled with references to the Messiah. Um, it, uh, next to the Psalms, Isaiah is quoted most frequently in the New Testament. Uh, in Romans, Paul quotes Isaiah at least 17 times. And uh, the uh, topics of, of judgment and sin and redemption 
are repeated over and over and over again in Isaiah. Uh, it is just so full of passion for people to get right with God. Uh, and so Isaiah is referred to as the Gospel of Isaiah. Some even have referred to it as uh, the Romans of the Old Testament. The life of Isaiah, we don't know too much about Isaiah. Excuse me? Yes. What, what does it mean, poetry, parallelism, and writing style? It is scarcely recorded in the Old Testament. Okay, Isaiah was a writer. He was, a, he was very artistic about his writing. He was a poet. Most of his uh, writing is in poetry form. Uh, very little is in prose. In chapter, there's our passages here and there where he breaks into prose. Uh, by prose, I mean he's just telling a story, describing it. But most of the time, he's writing poetry, um, and he's presenting his judgments and his visions in poetic form, in Hebrew poetic form. Okay. And uh, the beauty of the poetry, at least in the Hebrew language, I am told is uh, a very high level of literary ability. Uh, compared with the other Old Testament? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, he may have been a musician, and some speculate that he may have been a Levite because of that. But that's a speculation. Uh, we don't know that for sure, but in, in Isaiah chapter 5, I believe, he breaks into song. I will sing a song of uh, my vineyard. Uh, he, and he goes on about that. Under the life of Isaiah, like I said before, we don't know too much about him. Uh, we do know that his name, of course, means the Lord is salvation, or salvation is of the Lord. So typical, you know, uh, of the Old Testament. And his sons that he has later on in life, uh, ha he names them and gives them uh, uh, meaning, uh, which we'll get into in a little while. Uh, this is the guy who had a son whom he named Maher Shel Hel Hashbat. In order to pass this course, by the way, you're going to have to be able to pronounce that name. <laughs> Didn't he have two sons? Yeah, he had two sons. But Maher Shel Hel Hashbats was uh, one of them. And we can just call him Butts for short if you want. Butts? Butts. <laughs> Baz. Baz, but the Hebrew was Butts. You have to think Hebrew, boy. Butts. Maher Shel Hel Hashbats. Um, Isaiah was born to one named Amos, not to be confused with Amos, the prophet. It's a different Amos, A-M-O-Z, not A-M-O-S. Isaiah lived and ministered in Jerusalem or around Jerusalem most of his life. So he was a prophet of the southern uh, kingdom. Uh, the north was uh, being plagued and carried off. His response to the call was a very unusual one and we're going to get to into that in a moment well let's have a look right now if we compare his call Isaiah chapter 6 to the call of Moses or the call of Jeremiah quite interesting Did he open Jeremiah? now open to Isaiah six. chapter 6 by the way for your reading if you want to, I will give you permission to read it from the NIV. Oh. Fire didn't fall? Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, well, the text in the commentary would, yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Luke called Walbert and Greg came over the calls, too. Oops, we should not be talking. <laughs> okay. Um, in Isaiah chapter 6, we read it down in verse um, 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? 
Then said I, Here am I, send me. Why would this be unusual when you contrast this with the call of Moses or the call of Jeremiah? Well, Moses said that he didn't think he was worthy to do it. He was going, oh, don't send me. I can't do it. Right? Yeah. The Lord called him directly. The Lord called who directly? Moses yeah. to do the job. And this keeps kind of calling who, who out shows up? Within, yeah. within his ear. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Like a great commission. Yeah. But also uh, in the call of, what, what was the call of Jeremiah like? How did Jeremiah respond? Do you remember? Well, it may have been a vision, but do you remember how Jeremiah responded? Jeremiah said, I am but a child. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. So, the warrior I showed you. He destined before he was born. Yeah. And I will give you many nations. That's right. That's right. Don't worry about that. But he's here. Exactly. But Jeremiah and Moses both objected. That's my point. Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. So that's kind of unusual. It's an unusual response. Uh, but a welcome response. I think a good response. Um, I'm going to, by the way, as our homiletics course draws near, uh, I'm going to be speaking in the chapel for a couple of morning sessions, and one of my messages will likely be on the call of Isaiah contrasted with the call of Moses and Jeremiah. And uh, um, I want you as potential homiletic students to pay, pay close attention not only to content, but also to style and all those other things. I can't be there in the morning. Sunday morning? Maybe for those two Sundays you can be. I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll make it a requirement. Yeah. I think if in, in Isaiah chapter six, maybe he was surrounded by God's glory. Mm -hmm. So he has no idea what he say. Just the, the in the influence by the Spirit, he say he responded. Well. Said, yeah, we're speculating. We don't know. Yeah, we, don't know. we don't know the motivations of Isaiah's we heart except that his response was a good one. Um, Isaiah's ministry was not a popular one. In fact, according to tradition, according to rabbinic literature, Isaiah's death ends violently. Some say that he was put in a log and they cut the log in half. Some say that uh, he was wrapped in planks, uh, two planks, and uh, they cut him in half that way. Uh, I wouldn't doubt that there's truth to the story. It would be um, um, it would be confirmed if if that's what the writer of Hebrews had in mind when he talked about the heroes of faith and how some um, walked in faith, never having their faith fulfilled or never seeing uh, the fruition of their faith, and were torn asunder, were uh, torn by animals and sawn in half, you know, it makes reference to that. So maybe someone had Isaiah in mind, I don't know. He wasn't mentioned there, but uh, uh, tradition says he was cut in half. And Isaiah's style is certainly very unusual as a prophet. I guess maybe not so unusual because there might be some Isaiah chapter 20, at the same time spoke, spoke the Lord by Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off thy shoes from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign, and wander upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian prisoners. And the Ethiopians, captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered, the of Egypt, and they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia. So for three years Isaiah mooned uh, <laughs> the foreign nations, I guess. Um, at any rate, um, it sure makes you wonder about our God, doesn't it? I mean, we, we put God in a box and we come across portions like this, and, oh, how could he, you know? But... Uh, he was very, very forceful and blunt and direct in his messages. 
Um, so he leads As you mentioned, Ezekiel also. Was it Ezekiel? Or I thought it was Hosea. Ezekiel laid on his side. Is he the one that went and buried his loincloth and then dug it up again and it was all rotten? And Certainly, the prophets of the Old Testament were were pretty tough characters, and uh, I suspect lonely men as well. He was not popular. The world of Isaiah, the land of Palestine. Here, here's the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, right here. See me this? Do this? This is the Mediterranean Sea. Well, we have a map right there. Okay. Go north, and make a right turn. And Assyria is way over there towards the east. Okay? Uh, Syria itself is just north. Damascus is up north of, uh, straight north of Jerusalem. And um, so the northern tribes and Assyria are a source of all kinds of problems for Judah and Jerusalem. And that's the political ferment that's going on at the time of Isaiah. The authorship of Isaiah. I have a couple of articles here that uh, didn't, didn't get passed out, did it? There are two copies of articles on the authorship of Isaiah that got passed out by accident. They were laying right here. They were stapled. There we go. Someone else has a copy. No, I didn't. I took the staple out. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, if you want to you get your own copy, that's fine. Take it downstairs and photocopy it, okay? Um, okay, that's reason number one. What, fr uh, where? Uh, from the 40s. Yes. Because the 39 is the Old Testament oh. times, same number. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And uh, they too much describe about the clearly about the name, mention about the name of the, the Cyrus. Cyrus. It is, uh, if, uh, I believe that there is a prophecy, mm -hmm. but in the human point is too much correct. So okay. And also, <coughs> the concept is changed. The concept is tra transferred. Primarily, because of the predictions, that were so accurate and specific, even right down to naming the king and naming Babylon. Uh, the king is named, I believe, in the second book, what's referred to as the second book from chapter 40 on. But Babylon is mentioned in the first book. So that's a problem. You know, first they divided chapter from 40 on because the style was different. And then they said, uh oh, <laughs> Babylon is mentioned too, and it wasn't even in existence yet. And so, and that was in the earlier part. So, uh, so then uh, they came up with all kinds of schemes, you know, and divided Isaiah up into a whole bunch of different parts and said there must have been, you know, 10 or 12 different authors. And uh, that was hardly plausible. So most people have, most uh, liberal scholarship uh, has gone to either a two or a three authorship theory, uh, but primarily because of uh, the predictions. And they just don't want to believe. Just like in the book of Daniel, they don't want to believe that it was written two or three hundred years before the event actually happened. What is, what is your personal opinion? Uh, I believe that it's quite possible for, um, for an editor to have put the two together. Uh, I believe that Isaiah himself wrote both parts. But you believe the both parts? Is written by Isaiah, because correct? Jesus Christ, we are born. Yes. Yeah. I think the interesting thing is uh, the John Baptist. Somebody called is uh, Isaiah. He's uh, returning. Yes. To Isaiah. Yes. And Jesus Christ also. He is uh, kind of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. So maybe Isaiah it's is. Elijah. Uh, Elijah. 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 Yeah. Elijah. Isaiah. Okay. <coughs> 
<laughs> you make mistakes too. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll move on now into the exposition of Isaiah proper, and we'll take a break in about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, before we go into the exposition proper, uh, I want to just I'll, I'll, I'm just going to give this, give you this structure. You see in the chart in front of you, um, from uh, this is what you do when you want to break a book apart is that you look for the big argument, you look for the big divisions, the major divisions. And uh, Isaiah, it becomes so obvious, and most people have just divided Isaiah into two parts, from chapters 1 to 39, and then chapter 40 to 66, simply because in chapter 40, it is such an obvious, obvious difference. Uh, up until chapter 39, it's uh, doom and gloom, it's judgment, and then beginning in chapter 40, it just has a totally different tone. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, said your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished. Its judgment is over. For sin has been forgiven and uh, she's received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The time of judgment just passed. You know? Um, that's one way of dividing the book and I noticed that Schofield has even divided it that way. Uh, calling it part one and part two. However, I like to warning of judgment and promise of salvation and deliverance um, with the Assyrian threat in the backdrop. Okay, if you can imagine, um, in the background, the historical setting is the threat and the danger of Assyria. And here is Isaiah prophesying and calling down judgment and and uh, preaching towards repentance with that danger looming. Then, and that, by the way, is all written in poetry form, from chapters one to thirty-five. It's all prose. Or, I'm sorry, all po uh, Hebrew poetry, uh, except for occasional passages. But most everything is in poetry. Then, chapters thirty-six to chapter thirty-nine, Assyria is defeated. Babylonian captivity is predicted. He changes his style to prose. It's narrative. It's just talking about uh, historical events. And uh, the king changes from Ahaz to Hezekiah. Uh, Hezekiah is the focus in chapter 37 and 38. Hezekiah is healed with the poultice of figs, do you remember? And um, then in chapter 40, suddenly Babylon, Babylon is the backdrop. His, the historical context has changed entirely again. So, and so chapters 36 to chapter 39 act as a hinge that uh, the first part and the second part swing on. Do you see that? So if three, three also should apply then one to three like this. Somebody insists the three also should then be applied like this? One no, 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 no. So. Not necessarily. I don't think so. I, I've never heard them dividing the three authors like that, maybe you're right. You might want to check that out in your study. Now, here's something else that some people have done, and I don't like this kind of thing, okay? Because this smacks of uh, a, a kind of a piety that that is superimposed on something that didn't exist, and I don't believe was God's intention for us to deal with scriptures this way. You look at Isaiah and say it's 66 chapters. Well, look, there's 66 books in the Bible. What a coincidence. Um, there's 39 chapters in the first section. Well, there's 39 chapters in the Old Testament. Those 39 chapters are all about judgment. Well, the Old Testament is full of judgment. Chapters 40 to 66, there's 27 books there, just like in the ch chapters, just like in the New Testament. And it's all grace and, and redemption, and so is the New Testament. That That kind of stuff, I think, is is man-made it's a coincidence um, and, and and I would argue against that tr that kind of treatment of, of scripture and that's very easy to deal with too because 
in the original canon, by the way. First and Second Kings was one book. First and Second Chronicles was one book. So your theory is shot already. Okay, there weren't 39 books in the Old Testament canon originally. So stop and think a little bit before you enthusiastically swallow something like that. Okay. When someone comes up with schemes like that, push him for support. What are your sources? Where do you find that in Scripture? Do you have anything else confirming that? Do you have anything in Scripture itself that shows that that was God's intention? Or is this just a, a happy coincidence? You know? um, any questions on that type of treatment of God's Word? Do you disagree with me? I would see it that way, that it's just half a coincidence. Yeah. You just, just leave it that way. Yeah. Half coincidence. A happy coincidence. Happy. Uh -huh. uh, Jewish people, they don't doubt uh, any dual also sitting. They believe what? No, no. In the second century, yeah. a Jewish writer doubted Isaiah's authorship already. Yeah. So, uh, so, so even among Jewish theologians, uh -huh. there is a question about Isaiah's authorship, yes. But they, they, in their, in their book, they canonized him. Yes. Or yes. 66. But you see, they don't need to prove that Isaiah wrote all of the book of Isaiah because they don't believe in Jesus' words. We believe in Jesus' words, who refers to Isaiah as being the author of the first and the second book, you see. So, but they don't have the necessity of having to believe Jesus' words. Therefore, it's not a problem for them to say, well, somebody else wrote chapters 40 to 66. And I say one personal opinion. The God say, God can call the thing which is not existed, if he said it exists, because he's creator. He can call the thing if it is the but it not exist. I'm sorry, I don't understand your words. The, the what? Call the what? God can call uh, something which is not exist. Which does not exist. But as it exists, because he can make, he can make future, or he can, he can create. I yes. Didn't, I didn't yes. remember what the. What the yes. Is. So, as long as Jesus Christ is God, he said, I say, okay, he affirmed. I think he's the one also said, implied. Yeah. Then there is no any the argument because God said that it is the Oriental concept. Yeah. As long as he's truth, we can trust what he, he said this. Then in the human must not must not doubt. When they start to doubt, then is an unbelief attitude is starting. Okay. Um, something that we have to keep in mind with the our definition and our, our understanding of inspiration is that God, in the process of inspiration, did not interfere or intervene in the writing style of the individual authors. So whatever kind of personality Isaiah had and whatever writing styles he learned, God used his personality and his makeup to write the book of Isaiah. And even though we see two different writing styles in the book of Isaiah, uh, that's not so unusual. You can have a person write in two different writing styles, and that can be demonstrated even in modern authorship. So that isn't necessarily an argument against uh, the authorship of Isaiah. I can show you one of the first sermons that I wrote uh, back when I was 17 years of age and show you a sermon that I wrote today and you will say this is not the same person. Totally different writing style. It's not unusual. So it's not necessary to right away jump to the conclusion that uh, it had to be a different author just because of a different writing style. Okay. <coughs> um, so, we have the big structure given to us, and by the way, please uh, let me know when that tape is done. Will it be obvious? Yeah, it's still turning. Hi, Phil, just checking on you. Um, so, we've got the big structure from chapters 1 to 35. We have the Assyrian backdrop. It's written in poetry form, and King Ahaz is the major character there. Uh, at least he's the one that's reigning in Judah. Then we have chapters 36 to 39, the historical interlude. Assyria is defeated at the beginning of that. 
Babylonian captivity is predicted towards the end of that portion. It's written in prose, and Hezekiah is the ruling king. Then the third section, we have the Babylonian backdrop, providing the context for chapters 40 to 66. It's written again in poetry style or fashion, and King Cyrus is um, the major uh, monarch in that context. Um, yes? Um, that is um, a way of uh, denoting a what we refer to as a chiastic structure. By a chiastic structure, I don't were you you didn't take the exegesis course that I taught uh, was it like two years ago? Do you remember a chiasm? Did I not ever show you? Does anyone know what a chiasm is? Okay, that's very important. Can, by the way, will this pick up if I'm teaching up here? Um, it's barely, barely picking up. Okay. We're talking about a chiastic structure. Bring up the mic. A chiastic structure is a literary device that uh, is used a lot in Scripture, um, in the New Testament as well as in the Old Testament. One of the best examples that I can find of chiastic structure in the New Testament, if you'll turn with me, uh, to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter chapter 1 and 2. This stuff is exciting because here we begin to see how literary styles are used of God to, uh, to bring focus in on uh, an event, a central event. In Luke chapter 1, we begin um, the story, the birth narrative of Christ, with the story of Elizabeth and Zacharias. And we start the story with a man, an old man, by the way, in a temple. What's he doing in the temple? He's waiting, and he's the high priest, right? He's praying. An old man praying in a temple. Turn to Luke chapter 2 to the very end. What's the last story in Luke chapter 2 about? Hmm? Young man. in a temple. Hmm. Coincidence? Well, if that's all you had, you might think, well, that's a coincidence. But it's not. If you take the incidents following the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth through chapter 1, you will find an incident here, an incident here, an incident here, an incident here, and then you will see that the order reverses, and it goes like this, like this, like this, and like this, until these two become parallel. Okay, and right where this meets, this would be called the climax of the chiasm, or the chiasmus in Latin. This is the birth and naming of John the Baptist, and here we have the birth and naming of Jesus Christ. And that's the central focus of that narrative from chapter 1 to chapter 2. And the reason we call it a chiasmus is that it has the structure that follows the Greek alphabet key. Okay? And that's the focal point in that structure. And so a literary device that we have throughout the Old Testament is this kind of device. Why would they use devices like that? Well, they weren't sitting around a table. They didn't each have a book like you did in front of you. Okay? The tradition, the way things were taught, it had to be taught in structured form, whether it was alliteration, or chiasm, or parallelism, as in Hebrew poetry, or some other way to help you to remember something. Okay, And so to put something in a chiastic structure helped you to remember, because it gave you logical relationships from one unit to the next. 
And so that's how the tradition of the elders was passed along in many cases. That's how a lot of scriptures was, was passed on. And so we're going to see a lot of chiastic structure in the book of Isaiah. Is there, do, you, do you know the spelling? Chiastic. Actually, the, the, the way I see it is the noun would be chiasmus, or in an adjective form, chiastic chiastic structure or a chiasm a singular chiastic structure will be referred to as a chiasm uh, so to answer your question why is the outline numbered A, B and A in the chart well the chiasm I mean the focal point is the historical interlude there B okay and the parallel parts are the Assyrian backdrop and the Babylonian backdrop Got it? And so in the same way as we as we uh, note this kind of chiasm, you would call this A, A, B, B, C, C, D, E. Okay? Or sometimes in your chiasm you'll just have a singular D. Where there's one focal point instead of a parallel focal point. Each same word is up here like not necessarily the same word, the same concept. but the same concept. But there are different forms, and you'll see. Sometimes there's contrasting concepts in chiasm. Even, even two chapters or even many chapters? Sometimes in Zechariah, for instance, there is some wonderful chiastic structure uh, that just, oh, beautiful, beautiful. Um, so, I mean, is A, A what represents A? The Assyrian? No, is it is Pope A A B A. Yes. So what represents B A? The the poetry and the Assyrian backdrop. Uh huh. The Babylonian backdrop. Uh huh. Okay. So. Okay. All right. Now. <coughs> As you look for, uh, we've, we talked about the big structure, the big outline, which is a three-part outline here. Now the task is to find the smaller outlines within the big outline.